Thank you so much. It's a great privilege being here, uh, and we're very much, I'm very much grateful to Dr. McDermott, Dr. Hanauer, and the organizing committee allowing us uh, uh, to be here, inviting me here. So I have nothing to disclose. And one of the things when you talk about this to topic that I have to admit that there's no right answer here. It's about the patient. It's about the patient's expectations about life. It's about the patient's dreams. It's about the patient's future that we're privileged to serve. So this is what I teach and this is what I preach uh, during on daily rounds, daily teachings uh, in the Cleveland Clinic. If one can accept and live happily with a permanent ileostomy, trying to convince them to have an ileoanal pouch is a great disservice to them individually. I think it's very important. We need to put this aspect. If one is quite all right to have an ileostomy, I think it's our last business to try to have them convince them, especially in some of the Crohn's disease, Crohn's colitis, that you should be considering a pouch. Why? Because this, you know, the therapy of the Crohn's disease, Crohn's colitis is very humbling, you know, the pathology. The extent of the disease is very important consideration where the Crohn's is involving. And based on the rectal involvement of the Crohn's colitis, these are the procedures that we do. One option is if the patient has a bad perianal disease and a rectal disease, it's quite all right uh, and there's no medical therapy left, have tried and patient is ready to move on, just to go ahead and remove everything and give them an ileostomy. With humility and modesty, giving somebody an ileostomy uh, is really one of the best biologics that you can, you can find. It cures the Crohn's disease as long as it's an isolated Crohn's colitis. At the same time, the patients do make a big price. It's a life-changing event. It's a humbling event that this is something that they need to live for the rest of their life. And we as a surgeons are looking forward to getting these biologics to the point that I personally am willing to give all of my surgical practice. That is the future. The other option is take the disease colon out. If the sigmoid and the rectum is normal, do your anastomosis as a iliosigmoid or iliorectal anastomosis. Patients who have a really distal aspect of the rectum normal and very limited perianal disease and the rest of the colon has skip areas, then we may consider of a ileal pouch rectal anastomosis. And the last option is in patients where the prior option is available, is not available, considering doing a J pouch procedure. Now, when we debate about Crohn's colitis, whether it's okay to do it or not, there are two, two factors that I'd like to have you to focus. One, the technical reasons, but more importantly, it's the patient-driven reasons. Now, the first option is the end ileostomy, giving some ileostomy. We don't have another option. The patient needs to have a permanent back. The other option is ileosigmoid, ileorectal. Patient have a sick colon, may, may not also have a sick small bowel, and you can put the things back together. So does the ileal pouch rectal anastomosis. These are very good options still for these patients, plus at the biologics, for the reasons because you have another get-go or go around to avoid a permanent back. Our aim is to be able to continue to establish the gastrointestinal tract for our patients. So why it is a big deal not to consider to do an ileal pouch ileal anastomosis? I'm trying to set Asher. He likes to go after me, so that's right to raise the tone. So this is the ileal pouch rectal anastomosis. What exactly we do here? What we do here when the rectum is relatively normal 
and the patient has a small bowel that is suitable for a reconnection, which means that they do not have a lot of small bowel disease or just a limited small bowel terminal disease. It's quite all right to do this type of uh, anastomosis because they don't have the enough rectum to handle that capacity of the stool volume. So for that reason, it helps them out to be able to handle the volume of the stool and have them to avoid a permanent back for the rest of their life. Why? We can go another time around to avoid a permanent back if it's feasible. And we do have good results with this thing. As can be seen in this patient, he, she, she had a significant amount of skip lesions with normal colon in this area where the, you know, the, the straight iliorectal anastomosis is not possible because we removed most of the rectum with it. But he or she had a limited amount of rectum. What are the options? Either a permanent ileostomy or have this patient to consider an ileal pouch rectal anastomosis. But that is, that is not specifically what we will be talking about shortly. What I'm trying to get to is these things are pretty much okay to consider in these settings. And why not a J pouch in these patients? And what will our data show shortly? Why can we consider in these situations? Why? Because when we did this ileal pouch rectal anastomosis, patients showed the fact that they had pretty good results and they were able to, uh, you know, to obtain a gastrointestinal uh, continuity over 90% in eight years. And they had a very good functional outcome quality of, uh, you know, the, the quality of life scores comparing to the iliorectal iliosigmoid anastomosis. And this was associated with a very good satisfaction scores. So we conclude the fact that when Crohn's proctocolitis necessitates total colectomy, which is removal of the colon, and the length of the rectal stump precludes a straight iliorectal anastomosis, ileal pouch anal anastomosis can be considered a viable alternative to permanent diversion. So it offers a good long-term functional outcome. And this is the area of the debate. Can we just go another four or five centimeter and bring that pouch down? And the concern is legitimate why it should be done. It should not be done. Why it should not be done? Because if we do that, we may be bringing a disease to the small bowel, impacting the patient's life, and especially where the small bowel is so precious in our patients with small bowel Crohn's disease that this can be a very dangerous approach for them in the short term, the long term. So what exactly we do when we do a J-pouch? It's a technically demanding procedure. We orient ourselves. We put our finger to the anus. We live a centimeter or two of a de novo mucosa, come across with a staple gun, and then we create the J-pouch, and then we put a staple gun, and we, we make sure the fact that the trocar comes posterior to the staple line, and then bring the J-pouch, hook the things up. This instrument is a double circular stapler and cutter and you get two donuts out of it and you establish a continuity and it's a technically demanding procedure. So is it okay to do this procedure considering what setting? I know Dr. Cornbill is gonna get at me being critical beyond the Crohn's disease about the uh, IPAA even in the IBD setting but our patients do well when the indication is quite all right and these are the indications. 97% of our patients, they do really well after the surgery and they recommend the surgery for others in their situations. This is over 4,000 patients that we have privileged to serve in our institution. So the French needs to get the credit for this thing because they're the one who revolutionized this idea. They said that, why don't we give it a try? And they considered these pathologies, limited Crohn's disease in the colorectum, preoperative pathological, you know, the conformation uh, I itself, no history of anoperineal Crohn's disease, no evidence of anoperineal Crohn's disease involvement, and no evidence of small bowel involvement. And one of the critique, uh, you know, the, of this paper was, are we really considering Crohn's disease here, or should we be calling these patients an indeterminate colitis across the Atlantic? But again, they need to get the full credit because they revolutionize this concept by pushing the envelope on behalf of our patients. Now, what I say that thing is, I'm very encouraged as long as patients ask for it. When patients ask for us, I make sure the fact that the Crohn's disease in the colon and rectum only, 
and preoperative pathologic conformation of the diagnosis. This is a question mark because as much as we have great tests currently right now, we're still substandard to be able to tell to our patients, to our fellow human beings that you have Crohn's disease or not before the surgery, even after the surgery, and I'll come to that shortly. So if I have any concern that, I may tell my patients, you know what, let's stage the procedure and get the colectomy done first and see what the pathology will show and then you can decide for that afterwards. So to me, before I consider something now as a J pouch for a Crohn's, Crohn's, or Crohn's disease, I like to get that colon out and confirmed as much as possible. We learned the hard way. <coughs> I'm quite all right as long as the disease is very limited, excluding the rectovaginal fistula and no gross evidence of a small bowel disease. If they have a, you know, the evidence of a small bowel disease, then we cannot do that. In this setting, we cannot do that. We should not be doing that. We will not be serving our patients to consider a J-Bouch in this setting. Not a citizen in this setting where the disease are very significantly impacted perineum itself. Or in this setting, a lovely young teenager that who came with this presentation as a first manifestation of the Crohn's disease, that this cannot be done. Big ulcer. This will be really destroying this patient's life for the future. So what are the categories that we have we can consider or we cannot consider? We do the intentional IPAA before the surgery who had prior colectomy confirmed diagnosis, which means that preoperatively before the J pouch, doing Crohn's disease, we know that. Or we tried our best to exclude the possibility of the Crohn's disease before that, and we did a two-stage J pouch. What does that mean? Take the colon out, the rectum out. We did the J pouch without waiting, the confirming the gross, you know, the final pathology of the whole colon and the rectum. But unfortunately, in these settings, pathologists can tell us you guys were wrong. It came back as Crohn's disease. So what happened to those patients? And lastly, patient's pathology preoperatively, postoperatively came as ulcerative colitis, but disease declared itself as a Crohn's disease. Let's look at these patients. This is our 204 patients that who were diagnosed with Crohn's disease in different categories, what the results show. What mattered for these patients' outcome, it wasn't the pre-op diagnosis of Crohn's, it wasn't the post-op diagnosis of Crohn's disease. It was the delayed diagnosis of Crohn's disease and post-operative presence of fistula or sepsis. So we have no control of these things before the surgery in any way. So why would we taking this benefit of doubt on a motivated patient and avoiding a potential gastrointestinal tract continuity and avoid a permanent back? So this is our results. 20 patients that we had in these settings that we knew the diagnosis was preoperatively Crohn's, they did great. So did the postoperative diagnosis. The ones that who did really not do well were the diagnosis before the, you know, the after the surgery came back as UC or indeterminate, but disease declared itself to be a Crohn's disease clinically and pathologically. So these are the concerns, and the retention rates in these settings as a whole group is 71%. But when we look at it specifically for pre-op diagnosis is 85%, 87% for post-op diagnosis, the ones that puts us really in a bad situation where we have no control of the situation. The other centers' data differs, all, uh, differ, differs also. Some sites are also very reluctant to consider Crohn's, you know, doing a J pouch in this setting, which I respect. And this is the survival curve for the whole group. So good amount of patients can keep their pouch for a long period of time, and specifically, where the diagnoses were made preoperatively or postoperatively, they do also well. The ones that they do not well, once again, the ones that we don't have, have a control, what exactly is gonna happen? It's in a situation with respectfully like not to have a crystal ball to tell them what the future holds. So finally, I think this can be considered in selected patients as long as the desire and the intent is coming from the patient. Patients with presumed, and these, you know, the patients with presumed ulcerative colitis or interim colitis diagnosed with Crohn's from operative histopathology, they can also do well. But the patients who do not do well are the ones that we have no control over. And I think in these settings, can you go to the next slide, please? I think in this setting, it is very important to consider this thing 
in patients who are motivated with a good anal sphincter function with a minimal morbidity not to take this off the table, especially in the era of a multidisciplinary approach and act, we work together, we can consider further medical therapy in these settings. And I'm grateful for, next slide please, for one of our patients allowing us to use her picture in this setting that she's doing really well for the last four to five years. Thank you so much for your time.